Hi, it's me, Kirby Shivers, your friendly neighborhood drag queen. Duh. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Kirby. I'm a drag queen and I like talking about true crime. So that's what I'm going to do. If you're not new here, you already know the vibes, you already know the drill, and you were expecting me to look this good. <laughs> if you're interested, stick around because we're going to be talking about someone very interesting in my opinion. Um, so yeah, let's get into this. Just a little content warning. I don't get too into nitty gritty violence talk, but I will talk about the necessary stuff to talk about the case and tell the story. So just a little content warning. Okay, so I have been itching to talk about this story for a while. But the one thing being, there is not a ton of information out there about her. If I talk about the Hillside Stranglers and go in depth and include her, it would be too long of a video. If I didn't include her, I'd be remiss. So I decided, fuck it, I'm gonna just talk about her. And here we are. So today, we are going to discuss Veronica Compton, the infamous yet often glossed over Hollywood starlet turned attempted copycat killer. I have been so intrigued, infatuated, um, enthralled with Veronica Compton's story for like the last year. I had never really researched or watched much about or been that interested in the Hillside Stranglers until then. And when I found out about Veronica Compton, I was shook. Because, spoiler alert, she falls in love with Kenneth Bianchi and kind of does his bidding for him while he is locked up. Anyway, let's just start at the beginning, like the very, very beginning. At like, Veronica being born beginning. Veronica Lynn Compton. And side note, what a name. Honestly, wow. But anyway, Veronica Lynn Compton was born in 1956, the daughter of a Mexican immigrant father and a white mother. Often growing up, many people believed Veronica to have very exotic or sultry looks and be a very beautiful person. That's all to say Veronica was stunning. And that's the God's honest truth. I will tell you that much for free. This beauty garnered lots of attention and since she was growing up in Hollywood Hills, this attention led to a career path where she easily found modeling and acting work. For all intents and purposes, Veronica had a pretty good head on her shoulders. Her father was a popular political cartoonist. So Veronica grew up with a strong sense of culture and education and politics. And she spent most of her time as a teenager kicking with politicians and lawyers and judges while attending plays and discussing literature. So it came as no shock when her interest in modeling and acting wasn't holding her attention anymore. And she set her mind to more intellectual pursuits like being a playwright. But before we dive into that, we have to talk about the fact that Veronica's childhood wasn't all rainbows and butterflies and snobby Hollywood elite parties. Her childhood was rough to say the least, if we are to believe her side of events. And while Veronica was only 25 when she would cross paths with Kenneth Bianchi. Later interviews show a very extensive background of trauma from being committed to an asylum, being used by a sex trafficking ring, posing as a modeling agency, extensive surgery for breast and cervical tumors, drug smuggling, side hustling as a madam, and countless 
rapes and beatings. Even having a son when she was just 17 years old. It is not hard to see why she would fall into the trap of Kenneth Bianchi. But let's just go back a little bit before Veronica met Bianchi because I had mentioned that Veronica had set her sights on being a playwright or writing movies and it appears she must have been pretty okay at it because she had secured a deal with a major movie studio to produce eight films. She was looking for inspiration in 1977 when she found it or kind of it found her. Women started showing up on the side of the road posed and exposed for all to see. All of these women were sex workers and police and detectives quickly realized they had a serial killer on their hands. What the hell is with the 70s and serial killers? I definitely need to do a little more research into this because it's crazy. Was it just that there was no technology for them to get caught? So here's a quick shakedown of who the Hillside Stranglers were. Between October 1977 and February 1978, 10 young women between 12 and 28 were kidnapped, tortured, raped, and killed in the hills of Los Angeles, California. The media dubbed the killer the Hillside Strangler, but surprise, there was actually two of them, cousins, Angelo Bono Jr. and Kenneth Bianchi were later discovered to be the murderers. Veronica wasn't so much scared by these killings as she was intrigued. She had set out to write a horror script. In the 1970s, horror was a hot, hot, hot ticket at the box office and she had just found the story she wanted to write. When Kenneth Bianchi was finally caught in 1979, Veronica finally saw the man that was behind the terrible crimes and she felt some sort of strange connection with him, thinking that his tearful performance was actually pretty touching. I don't quite understand but we're just gonna keep trekking along. I'm sure it doesn't hurt that um, he actually wasn't that bad looking either. Either way, Veronica was very intrigued and she wanted to talk to him. She wanted him to read her script and give his feedback on it. So this is when in 1980, she began writing to him in prison. At first, Bianchi ignored her letters, but since she had nothing to lose by sending them, she just kept sending them. And slowly but surely, Veronica began exposing more and more of herself, telling him about her career as a model, her abundance of lovers, some of which were female, and her connections in Hollywood. She also included photos of herself in these letters, more of a show, don't tell type of situation. And in one of these photos, she it looks like a professional kind of artsy playboy shot almost. She is in a nightgown and she's in a hotel room. I don't know who took the photo, which is kind of intriguing, but she is soaked with a sensual, sultry look on her face. And it's a very enthralling photo, especially considering, you know, what it would be used for and what it would eventually lead to. Bottom line, she looks gorgeous in the photo and eventually Bianchi started replying to her letters. Now, time goes by and by the time Veronica meets Bianchi in person during a prison visit, the script she had sent had long been forgotten. It seems at this point, Veronica was in deep, deep, deep lust with Bianchi, even telling him out loud multiple times how badly she wanted to have sex with him, telling him that basically anytime they spoke on the phone, she would 
orgasm while they were doing so. She even confided in him that she herself had murdered someone at one point. But this is almost certainly a lie. Just a way to try and impress Bianchi. Either way, she is trying very hard to make him love her. From here on out, Bianchi actively began to woo Veronica, sending her little love notes and poems, long heartfelt letters, and basically proclaiming she was the only person he could trust and the only one he wanted. I highly doubt Bianchi was actually ever in love with her, but we'll get into that later. So what about this movie script I had mentioned earlier? Well, Bianchi did eventually get around to reading the script, and when he did, he was shocked to find that it was pretty much just his crimes, except a woman was the one doing the killing. The twist being that this woman was also killing sex workers, but she was taking semen, depositing it in the bodies to make it seem like a man was guilty. Honestly, it's a pretty genius idea for a movie script, but that's besides the point because when you think about the fact that these women were actually murdered by some piece of shit, it's not that great of an idea anymore, you know? It just shows that real life is worse and more scary than movies could ever be. But Bianchi didn't see it as just a movie script. He saw it as a perfect opportunity to clear his name. He wanted Veronica to travel to Bellingham, Washington, the location of his final victims, and take his semen with her and while she was there, target a college-aged woman, kill her in the exact same manner, and place his semen in her body. And make it look like they had arrested the wrong guy. At first I was like, but logistically it doesn't make sense because this is still your semen. They would just be like, you're still guilty? but it's the 80s and DNA testing wasn't as prevalent. Also, my search history is a little sus right now, but I found out that semen loses its potency as evidence the more it's tampered with or the older it gets. Hi, hey, editing me here, ish. I'm just jumping in. There are a few things I realized I forgot to mention. Bianchi is what's known as a non-secretor. Basically, in layman's terms, what that means is when he secretes any sort of liquid, in this case, specifically semen, he doesn't leave behind any trace of blood evidence or blood type. Basically, yeah, they could have figured out blood type, but if they had been able to test it, they wouldn't have been able to find a match anyway. So yeah, more than likely this might have worked. It wouldn't work. Anyway, Bianchi sat on this idea until the day Veronica told him she would do anything for him and he decided to put it to the test and tell her the plan and she agreed. Next thing she knew, Veronica was on a plane, disguised inexplicably as a pregnant woman, and smuggling Bianchi's semen across state lines to Bellingham, Washington. The plan was for Veronica to return to the same college campus Bianchi had attacked prior, find a small woman, overpower her, and kill her, making it look like they got the wrong guy. However, Veronica was not successful, so she returned to the motel, did a bunch of coke, and then decided to go out for a drink. She went to a nearby bar and started chatting up random people, 
And this is where she would meet 25-year-old Kim Breed. The two hung out, chit-chatted, drank, and eventually Veronica invited Kim back to do some more coke. Kim was not interested. She refused the offer, but she still offered to give Veronica a ride home. Once back at the motel, Veronica was able to convince Kim, you know, no snorting lines, but just come on up and we can have a glass of wine. So the two returned to Veronica's room. Once Kim was inside, Veronica realized she couldn't waste this opportunity. So while Kim sat on the bed, Veronica made her way to the bathroom, opened her purse, and pulled out a length of cord she had been hiding. She kind of had to be her own hype person and get herself going and remind her how Bianchi had told her to do it. He told her that if she had the element of surprise, it would be incredibly easy and it would be over in mere seconds. But that was not the case in this instance. The moment Veronica got the cord around Kim's neck, she realized Kim was stronger than she had anticipated. And Kim, being the badass that she is, reached behind her, grabbed Veronica, pulled her forward, and flung her to the floor. Once Veronica was on the floor, Kim saw the perfect opportunity to escape, and so she did just that, running and making her way out the front door. Veronica panicked, grabbed her shit, fled the hotel room, hopped on a plane, and made her way back to L.A. She knew it would not be long until Kim told the police, and the police came knocking on that motel room door. This part confuses me because basically she blew her own cover because this absurd disguise she wore, this pregnant disguise, wasn't fooling anyone. And for some reason, at some point, she threw this hysterical fit in the middle of the airport, and it just made her that much easier for police to track her down and arrest her. So on October 3rd, 1980, Veronica was arrested for attempted murder. After Veronica was arrested, Bianchi, of course, you know, hi, is the Pope Catholic, Bianchi quickly lost interest and his letters became shorter and more infrequent and Veronica knew he was done with her and she was devastated. To her, she basically was losing her boyfriend all because she failed to commit murder. Now she was in some deep shit and facing charges. This is all proof that, you know, as they say, men ain't shit. Bianchi clearly didn't really love her because if he did, he would have stood by her the way well, I wouldn't say she, let's not get into it. Let's just say he didn't love her and she knew it. About a year later, Veronica received the sentence of life in prison with the possibility of parole and she was set to serve that sentence at the Washington Corrections Center for Women. While here, Veronica began to receive letters from male admirers very similar to the ones she had sent Bianchi not that long ago. It's very interesting to see this weird occurrence. I don't know what to, how to describe it, but like this reversal, turning of the tables. Does this make sense? This whole like she was infatuated with a serial killer, sent him letters. Now she was an attempted killer and people were sending her letters. Just very interesting. I don't think you hear that very often in true crime. At least I don't. So I wanted to mention it because I wanted to. Uh, I don't know. One of the letters uh, and one of the main correspondents she would hold up was from Doug Clark, aka one half of the Sunset Strip Killers, 
aka another serial killer. <laughs> wow. Rumors have always swirled around about this and they still to this day do, but it appears Veronica wasn't very interested in Doug. She was mostly just using this correspondence to make Bianchi jealous and it quickly fizzled out even though there are multiple claims that they were engaged and they were obsessed with each other and what have you but Veronica has always disputed these claims and to this day I'm sure she would dispute these claims. Then in 1987 Veronica attended one of the lectures that was held in the prison for prisoners. The lecture was held by a political science professor named James Wallace, a man who was at this point, well, who because of how time works would always be, was 26 years older than Veronica. But Veronica was still very interested in him despite the age gap and began writing him letters. And then one day, James replied. After two years of back and forth, James left his wife of 38 years to go on, be with Veronica, and marry her in a prison ceremony. I, I'm not here to judge, but sometimes, you know, this is YouTube, and I can't help what my face does. And so if I'm like, huh? then so be it. Now, do you guys remember the son I mentioned way, way, way back towards the beginning of this video? Yeah, well, in 1988, Veronica actually escaped from prison to go visit her son, but was caught in Arizona before she could get to him and returned to prison. Once she was married to James, she actually convinced him to find her son and adopt him, which he did. And then after a few healthy conjugal visits, Veronica actually became pregnant and gave birth to a second child, a daughter. Now, considering all this and considering whatever, whatever, Veronica was actually granted parole in 1996, but after failing to maintain regular visits with her counselors and failing multiple checkups by social services, she was returned back to prison until 2003 when she was officially paroled for good. And ever since then, Veronica has maintained a pretty low-key life. In, I believe, 2016, Veronica did give a very, very, very brief interview to a website called Pelican Bomb. She was seemingly pretty embarrassed about her time as a woman who was known to be infatuated with serial killers. She also talked about how she began releasing music in 2013. So of course, I listened to the music and honestly, it kind of slaps. I can't lie. It's very like psychedelic coffee house, indie artist vibes, some like kind of spooky, kooky Bjork type shit. Of course, I will do the Lord's work and I will link the albums below and I do recommend checking them out. It actually gives you a much better sense of who Veronica is, especially now. And you do see lots of like updated photos of her. It appears she is still with James and that they both maintained a strong relationship with their kids. So it honestly really feels like intense fatuation or temporary insanity is to blame for what happened between Veronica and Kenneth Bianchi. And there is a term for these things. Hybristophilia. I'm going to read from a screen because my brain can't maintain all these big words. 
Hyperstophilia is a sexual interest in and attraction to those who commit crimes. A paraphilia in which sexual arousal, facilitation, and attainment of orgasm are responsive to and contingent upon being with a partner knowing to have committed a crime. Now, this makes sense because, you know, this explains Veronica's claiming to orgasm multiple times by just simply talking to Bianchi on the phone. And there's more that makes sense because it is claimed by some psychologists for my research, specifically Catherine Ramslin from Psychology Today, stating that some women see these convicted felons as the perfect boyfriend because they always know where he is. They always know he is more than likely thinking about them and they get to claim they are loved and that they are in a relationship without any of the day-to-day -day pressures of actually maintaining a relationship. For example, he never has to see them like in a bad moment, in a messy moment, looking ugly. This fantasy of her being perfect is always there because of how infrequently they actually interact. And wow, that's a lot to unpack and honestly beyond my capability, but it does make sense. Looking at it from this perspective, you can understand why this could be a big reason in people being attracted to the idea of dating prisoners who are currently incarcerated. That is all I have for Veronica Compton. So... I hope you liked today's video. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Tell people about it. Let them know you like this video. We've also come to the point in the video where if you haven't already and you feel so inclined, go ahead and subscribe. Stick around and hang out with me whenever I post a new video. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye. A goodbye.